Okay. So I was asked to um, address the question of why did uh, early gold active therapy fail in recent trials? Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess I should, before I start the talk, I should say that I only launched the recent trials because I hoped to prove that early gold directed therapy would usher in a new era in the care of septic, septic shock. So no one was more depressed than me on the day I actually unblinded the process trial and thought, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> because um, the motivation for the work was largely because I felt that acute myocardial infarction had really uh, moved into overdrive um, in the late 80s and early 90s with uh, advances in new therapies for the early care of acute myocardial infarction, that those first trials like the ISIS trials and the Gusto trials meant that it became very important to find someone at the moment they had chest pain and then put them in a very protocolized, ritualized care pattern, at which point then you could uh, thereafter treat everyone the same and then just change one thing at a time in an RCT. And you just go bang, bang, bang. And over the process of years, you would just make the care better and better and better. And I knew that the management of septic shock was completely all over the place. And then Manny had his study, the river study, and uh, it was really ushering this notion of a standardized way of managing these first few hours of septic shock. And I didn't necessarily think that it would all be perfect, but I was certainly hopeful that it would be better than usual care. And that in so doing so, we would then say, aha, now we have a new baseline, and now we can start tweaking different parts of it. <laughs> so it uh, didn't, didn't quite work out that way. So. So let's start by thinking about <coughs> uh, what were the underlying concepts behind early gold directed therapy for sepsis and septic shock. So as I just alluded to, we believe that there are golden hours for septic shock, and we are marching through these golden hours. The clock is ticking from the moment the patient is arriving at the hospital. In fact, from before they arrive at the hospital. Now remember, conceptually, when Manny published his study in, nine, in 2001, until that point, septic shock was really cared for in the ICU in many people's eyes, that, that, that people might do various things beforehand, but the point was you got them to the ICU and it was intensive care specialists that cared about sepsis, and there was very little recognition of sepsis in the ED. So concept number one was no. The clock is ticking. What you do matters even in the emergency department. Furthermore, in identifying the patients, while there would be some patients that would look overtly sick, there were, there were a large number of patients who could be in shock, but that shock presentation was somewhat cryptic. And so you had to think about measuring a lactate. The patient might look a little sick, but they might not be overtly hypotensive, and you had to screen. Then you had to immediately think about early treatment that included a bunch of things. First of all, you could give antibiotics and you could restore blood pressure um, as measured by CVP, but that would not be enough because it's not enough to fix the blood pressure. Instead, there would be persistent systemic oxygen delivery defects, which, as Manny had pointed out, could be measured conveniently by an SCVO2 catheter. And remember, back in the 1990s, the only way we could measure SCVO2 um, SVO2 had traditionally been with a PA catheter, and people thought SCVO2 wasn't even a reliable marker. So what people don't always remember is that Manny actually published earlier studies in the earlier 90s, already helping lay the path that SCVO2 was a poor man's SVO2. And since no one was going to float a PA catheter in the emergency department, no one was thinking about systemic oxygen delivery in the emergency department, but you could put this catheter in, measure an SCVO2, and it would be a reasonable proxy for SVO2, and so therefore it was a window in systemic oxygen deficit. And so therefore, you could actually think about goal-directed therapy 
even outside the heavy, intense monitoring environment of the ICU. But that to pull all of this off, you needed a protocolized approach because the clock was ticking and you had to march through a set of steps. Okay, <clears throat> so what was not tested in the early gold therapy trials? Remember, the only test is for the things that you do differently in each arm. If you give the same thing to people in both arms, that's not a test. Um, I don't know why I have to say that. <laughs> I have to say that because even in letters to the editor at the New England, we have had to repeatedly state that the only things tested were the things done differently in the two arms or in the three arms. So not tested because provided in all arms was the notion of early recognition of septic shock. If you didn't recognize septic shock, you couldn't be in the trial because this pesky little thing like consent and uh, like actually being able to find the patients. If you found the patient 12 hours later and said, oops, they had septic shock, we'd been missing them all along. Well, we just enter them into the trial arm, we'll put them in the usual care arm because we missed the wind. <laughs> of course you can't do that. So you have to find them early and then randomize them. So that means that everyone was found early in the trial. Um, IV fluids and vasopressors. You couldn't get into the trial until you had fluid unresponsive shock. So you had to get that initial fluid loading. And that's actually what early gold record therapy does. It gives the 30 cc's per kilo, and then it starts the six hours there afterwards. Um, <clears throat> Furthermore, something that people forget because they keep on, and I will come to this later, but they keep on thinking about how, well, the river study took place where the usual care was terrible. The usual care in Detroit included putting an arterial line and a CVP into every patient in the ED. It was actually more aggressive than the usual care nearly everywhere else. Certainly in our own institution, we never put an art line in every single septic shock patient in the ED. I don't think we even have docs that could do that. Futzing around, trying to get an arterial line in the ED? No, they would just like call for an ICU bed and send them up. The lines half the time were put in in the ICU. All right. So what was tested then? The question tested was in the setting where you have recognized the patient to be in septic shock, where you have started IV antibiotics and where you have started IV fluids, is there benefit from the addition of monitoring with SCVO2 and then using that to drive a set of protocolized instructions for the use of fluids, vasopressors, dibutamine, and PAC cells? So the first test of that was Manny's paper, published in 2001, and <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little window, not on publishing, but on funding. Uh, I thought about writing a grant to test this uh, within just a couple of months of this paper in 2001. And yet it took me <laughs> until 2014 <laughs> to get the, the paper published. That's how long it takes to write the protocol, try to get funded, don't get funded the first time. Everyone thinks it's a stupid idea. Who cares about early gold directed therapy? Eventually getting it funded and so forth. Calling up um, an old former fellow, uh, Ronaldo Bolomo, who is now back in Australia and saying, Ronaldo, why don't you do this study too? And then the Australian study turns up a few months later calling up a friend, Kathy Rowan, in London, and she goes and does the same thing, and so we go bang, 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 and we have three large multi-center trials. So the time lag is really long, but, in, but, it, but it is the way it's meant to work. You have a, like a phase two single center proof of concept study, looks very promising, and then you just immediately, immediately, 13 to 14 years, run out and repeat in the multi-center setting, and hopefully it would work, but as many of you know, it, uh, uh, it obviously didn't. So the original point estimate um, was uh, incredibly positive for rivers. Alan Jones had a study, but it wasn't quite the same. And then we had this, this so-called triptych or trilogy of these big multi-center trials, which all found very similar results. Okay, <clears throat> so what went wrong? Why was the river study different from subsequent studies 
does this mean early management and aggressive identification of patients is not necessary, and what should we do now? So why did the RCT results differ? Uh, were they asking different questions? Uh, no, uh, it was actually an identical question. It was, as I just stated, in the setting of recognition, early antibiotics, early fluids, what's the benefit of these incremental steps of SCVO2 monitoring and protocolized instructions? Exactly the same question. Different patients, maybe, we'll talk about that. Different co-interventions, maybe, we'll talk about that. Uh, the law of numbers, maybe. So let's unplug these a little bit. Different patients. Um, there's no way really of knowing exactly how well the population coming to the hospitals in process, arise, et cetera, are or are not different from the people who were going to Henry Ford ED. There's no question that Henry Ford serves a relatively poor part of Detroit to had a high African-American population. They had a lot of underlying comorbidity. But actually, many of the ICUs in process were in large urban university hospitals. Downtown Chicago isn't that different from downtown Detroit and so forth. Um, but it's quite possible that just by coincidence, we could have been picking from a set of patients that had a different underlying protoplasm in ways that were not really captured. Uh, by our measures of underlying comorbidity. Um, what about events prior to ED arrival? We don't really know uh, exactly what was being done in the ambulance. We don't know how long people waited at home. We don't know if there were cultural factors about the way in which people accessed health care from the moment they accessed their primary care or they sat at home with a worsening cough, etc. Who knows? In terms of case mix on arrival, we have a certain amount of information on type of infection and degree of shock and all sorts of things that we wrote down on baseline. Now, Manny collected the same information, but two different research groups can both say whether there's a history of heart disease or not, but you don't exactly know how they tested for a history of heart disease. Some of these things are somewhat standardized, but there could be little differences. Um, you could certainly do some post hoc subgroup analyses by things like severity of illness, and this is from process, this is in the middle of the supplement, where we took our cohort and we looked by tercials of Apache 2. Um, by the way, tercials, um, probably the longest conversation we had with the New England Journal of Medicine was whether the word tercile existed. Uh, is it a tercile or a tertile? Uh, at one point they were saying, we can't find either in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. We were finding uh, English dictionary and British dictionary versions. Just, yeah, we're not, we're not British. Uh, <coughs> we don't need to learn anything from the UK. At one point, they were talking about using um, uh, three, quint uh, three quantiles. And actually, I think if you read the paper, <laughs> I think in the end, we ended up quantiles of three. Is is what we went with, because they just couldn't work out. They weren't happy with it. So I, <laughs> I went back to tercels. So this basically just shows that the tercels of Apache 2 went from less than 17, 17 to 23, or greater than 23. And the tercels of baseline lactate were patients less than 3.4, 3.4 to 5, and greater than 5.3. And people immediately were thinking, well, maybe Manny studied sicker patients. But you can see over to the right-hand side um, the group that had to have a lactate of at least 5.3, their, me their mean lactate was actually almost 8. And this is a tercel, this is a third of a 1,600 patient or 1,400 patient trial. This is, the tercels on the far right are bigger than the original river study. So it's not like it's a tiny little subgroup. Th this is a large body of incredibly sick patients. And... Um, the higher lines are the worst lines. Mortality is ascending on the y-axis, and the red line is the ergo-directed therapy arm. So there, there was absolutely no evidence, at least on visual inspection in our own study, that there was an obvious difference by severity of illness. But that's not to say that lots of people didn't think that the patients were nonetheless different and that we just hadn't studied sick enough patients. Um, now, so newer trials included a wider range of patients, and many did have a lower mortality of illness, a lower severity of illness, but the average Apache 2 was almost identical. And as I just showed, we didn't 
see an obvious signal just looking inside the individual trials. Uh, and as I just said, the subsets were larger. One thing that came up a lot was that people said, what about the SCVO2? Your SCVO2 is lower, sorry, is higher than Manny's SCVO2. This is a crucial thing to understand. Manny, because he was putting central lines in every patient, including in the usual care arm, measured SCVO2 before the fluid bolus. Whereas we did the fluid bolus, and then if they were still in shock, randomized them. And if they were randomized to usual care, they didn't get an SCVO2 catheter. So we only reported SCVO2 post-fluid bolus in the, in the river's arm alone. That's why our SCVO2s look higher than Manny's SCVO2s. I've written that God knows how many times. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable how people don't seem to understand that. But um, the SCVO2s are not comparable between the studies, not because the studies were studying people with different SCVO2s. The studies were measuring the SCVO2s at different time points. Um, what about different co-interventions? There's no question that we ran the multicenter trials 10 to 15 years later. And if you think about the history of critical care, Manny did his study before the ARDSNET study was published, showing low tidal volumes are beneficial. He did his study before the TRIC study said you should manage people with hemoglobins of seven grams per deciliter. And he did his study before Greet Vandenberg told us that maybe we should run tighter blood sugar. That's a slightly rockier course, but there's no question that back in the 90s, we actually tolerated far higher blood sugars. And indeed, our patients were managed with low tidal volumes and much tighter glucose control. And there's no question that that could have made a difference. If you have much better background care, you will tend to have a lower overall mortality for the same severity of illness. And you could mitigate the consequences of delayed resuscitation. In other words, <clears throat> you could either narrow uh, the possible absolute risk reduction and you could even narrow the relative risk reduction. By that, what I mean is, if, if everyone is getting better and the overall mortality drops, even if the relative risk reduction stays the same, the absolute risk reduction gets smaller. But furthermore, if better ICU care really helps, it can fix bad resuscitation. So in other words, the patients in the usual care arm might have been truly resuscitated in a worse way than the river study, but then you come along and you make smarter moves in the ICU afterwards, and you help mitigate the consequences of the cytokine storm or whatever was left unchecked by bad resuscitation. So that's definitely plausible. Okay, and then the law of numbers. All, you know, all studies are m models of truth. I can't believe this is the third talk I've given here. It's the third time I've talked about how we draw from infinite populations. <laughs> but I'm going to say it one more time. Imagine there's an infinite population of septic shock. What you're really doing in a trial is that you're, doing, you're drawing two random populations, uh, two random samples from the, from the infinite population. You give one sample, one intervention, and the other, the other, and then you compare the two. And the p-value is really a measure of if the outcomes are different, could that have happened by chance alone? If you just picked two samples from the infinite population and not done any different, anything different to them, they were just randomly picked from it, could they have differed by this amount by random chance alone? Uh, and that works, assuming you can draw randomly from the population and you get to see all the possibilities if you had done thousands of rivers trials, etc. Um, but the problem here is that small studies don't have equal opportunity to be published. Small positive studies are published more often than small negative studies. And so you end up having uh, a chance of having random chance alone and the p-value is an inaccurate estimate of the frequency by which it could have happened by random chance alone. And so you can see this visually where when you do smaller studies, so the sample size is on the y-axis, then if the true difference of this infinite population is down the line down the middle, 
if you draw smaller samples from that infinite population and you measure the difference in outcome, there's more spread around the true truth when you're only doing smaller samples. In other words, if a coin truly was 50-50 and you drew it out and you tossed it 100 times, it would usually be 50-50. But if you drew it out to do sets of 10, it might sometimes be 4-6 three, seven, and so forth, it would be more unstable, even though the truth was it should be 50-50. And now what happens is if all those smaller studies, those ones that could have ever been done, don't get published as often when they're negative, then you get a, dis you get a distorted distribution and you're more likely when you see very large skewed effects that might actually simply be drawn from the random distribution, and these are more likely to be noticed. Okay, all right, so if the trials have all been negative, does that mean early management is not necessary? Now, this should be easy. I should be able to tell you no. Early goal directed therapy trial tested the benefit. No trial tested recognition, antibiotics, or fluids, because everyone had that. So we cannot conclude early management is not necessary, even though many people read the papers and said, oh, the whole early goal directed therapy thing is nonsense, and then it got everyone very upset. We're not saying you shouldn't recognize septic shock, and we're not saying you shouldn't give antibiotics. We were only testing that incremental question. And indeed, in the background, the prevailing wisdom has been, if anything, early management is necessary with, <coughs> with dropping mortality rates for the same severity of illness. <coughs> okay, so what residual questions are there after this? Well, the null results could indeed still be because of some weird thing with severity of illness, or maybe it's the comparison group. Maybe something is going on in the usual care arm. And although we could look a little bit in individual trials, they were not well-powered to explore subgroups. So this is a... a bar coaster from uh, NUSA, from the ANZIX clinical trials group. I flew over there, first of all, in 2004, I think, to a meeting in Adelaide, and that's when I first pitched to Ronaldo. We're going to do this trial in the U.S. We don't have funding yet, but we're going to try to get it. But we won't have a big enough sample size. We probably need four or 5,000 patients, and I doubt we can get more than 1,500 why don't you write the grant in Australia? And we thought maybe about writing one big trial, and then we realized the funders wouldn't go for it. So then we started thinking, as early as 2007, let's do a prospective individual patient data meta-analysis and combine all the data. So let's harmonize all of the data dictionaries. We need to put them all into one common place, common entry criteria, and so forth. And that's exactly what we did. <coughs> So that got published uh, just a few months ago uh, in the New England where we took the raw patient data from all the trials based on a prospectively defined individual patient level meta-analysis. And a couple of things we looked at, again, we looked in much more detail at severity of illness by Apache 2 Tercile, now with 1,200 patients uh, that have a, an Apache of at least 20. Uh, mean score of 25 and an overall mortality rate of 42% and absolutely no signal. We also looked at a customized predicted risk of death model and in the upper tercile in that group, the mortality rate was actually 46%. This is an incredibly sick population, over 1,200 patients and still no benefit. Uh, we looked at usual care. So, we knew, we, we now had about 150 hospitals across three continents, across all the trials, and we could see what their usual care was like from all the patients in the control arm. So then we said, well, some of these hospitals will be, tend to be hospitals that, for the same kind of patient, will tend to give a lot of vasopressors or a little vasopressors, a lot of fluid or less fluid, and maybe the benefits of early goal directed therapy differ depending on the propensity to be aggressive or not in your usual care practice. So we built a propensity for at the site level for sites to give vasopressors or IV fluid in the usual care arm and then stratified the sites 
and then looked at the outcomes of early godhood therapy at sites that sat within different tercels of intensity of usual resuscitation practices. And you can see there's a big difference. The sites in the lowest third for the, the average, the adjusted average patient in the propensity model gave uh, vasopressors one in four times, and in the most intense places for the same kind of patient, we're giving vasopressors two thirds of the time. Likewise, there's an almost threefold variation in the typical amount of fluid given for the typical patient. So there really was a massive variation in the background practice of the centers. When we looked at that, we still found <laughs> no signal <laughs> from early gold therapy therapy. So even again, in over 1,200 patients in the places that hardly ever gave vasopressors, uh, if they were then randomized to always giving vasopressors and giving early gold therapy, there was still no incremental benefit. And if you went to places that hardly gave anyone any fluid, and then they were randomized to getting a ton of fluid in early gold therapy, there was still no benefit. One thing, though, <coughs> is what about care for missed patients? I keep on talking about this. You couldn't get in the trial unless someone noticed you had septic shock. And people said things like, well, you did your trial in Pittsburgh and at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and, but what about all these other places where they don't do very good care? And I thought, well, that's a bit insulting. First of all, care at Mass General might not be that good. I'm sure it's great in Pittsburgh. But, <coughs> but what they failed to realize is that this was not care at the Mass General, and this was not care at the University of Pittsburgh. This was care for the subset of patients in Pittsburgh that we recognized to have septic shock. We could still have people coming in and the residents blow it and they never notice the patient has septic shock and then suddenly they're hypotensive on the floor a day later and they go, Christ. But those patients aren't in the trial. So there's, we're only studying a small slice of septic shock. Many patients may have been missed at participating sites. Likewise, they'd be, it is true that it could be cared for at places that maybe aren't as aggressive as Mass General or Pittsburgh or wherever. So I actually think there's a pretty rich research agenda on still thinking about ensuring the basics of how to detect every patient so that you never miss a case. Because in all of our trials, in the patients that we picked up, even those that were quite sick, they actually did pretty well. So the, the, there's some value to actually doing this, trying to make sure that you never miss a case. And maybe even, uh, we shouldn't be thinking about early goal therapy, maybe we should be thinking about VEGDT, actually moving up resuscitation into the ambulance and so forth. All right, and then, of course, we didn't test anything else. We didn't test any non-invasive monitoring. We didn't test any protocols that guided resuscitation based on regional oxygen hypoperfusion or other measures of hypoperfusion other than oxygen. We didn't test different kinds of IV fluids or vasopressors or any of those things. So in conclusion, benefit of specific early goal-directed therapy, that very specific EGDT protocol was not verified. Um, possibly, but not likely in my opinion, due to differences in case mix. I've tried to suggest to you, we could look in very similar patients, couldn't still find an, 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 uh, a benefit. Probably more likely due to differences in background care, definitely real, big difference in background care, or law of numbers. Early detection in antibiotics and fluids are still the mainstays of treatment. We never said they weren't, we never tested it. Uh, and residual questions are still abound, such as novel resuscitation monitoring, uh, dissemination of best care for all patients, and so forth. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, we have time for a quick question. And you know you can submit written questions on the app at the bottom, if you wish. <laughs> there was me thinking I had finally managed to present an early gold earth therapy and not have a single question. <laughs> I, I have a comment, actually, from Pittsburgh. It reminds me, uh, uh, in the 70s, when they started to investigate barbiturates after cardiac arrest. Yeah. It's about background therapy. They had a miraculous monkey trial in Pittsburgh showing a fantastic effect 
of all these monkeys who got barbiturates compared to a control group. But then later when you started to look at what's happened, the background care was very different because the control animals had been done a couple of years before where the level of care was different. And then they compared that to something which was done three years later. So th then the background care was obviously the reason why, they, why the uh, results were unreliable. So the quality of background care can change very much over the years, there's no question. Yeah, I think it's a huge point. And I think it's also true that, um, in a way, the reverse is also true. The things you end up uh, finding not beneficial because the time has changed. It's also true that there's certain things you do now that are very helpful now, had you done them before, wouldn't have helped because there were other things you were doing badly that swamped the potential benefits of other things that you now do. And that's true, for example, I think of a lot of non-invasive surgical procedures. It would actually be hard to pull them off in the past in the midst of all the mess that was going on. So um, you tend to, interventions uh, are a thing of their time. Um, that they, they work or don't work very much in both directions, depending on the, the context in which they're studied. So. Yeah. Hans? You want to <laughs> I'm going to jump in before Hans uh, has his uh, with a quick question. Uh, very nice you showed in the meta-analysis that you presented uh, uh, a, a assessment of fluid resuscitation styles and we've had another guest plenary presenter here who uh, shared with us her uh, experience in uh, children in a region of the world aggressive uh, or fluid boluses. Do you, yeah. do you suspect fluid boluses are going to be an issue in adults also? So I know calf very well and um, I also know that there's a paper in press um, that's going to come out in a pretty well-known major medical journal um, in about three weeks that specifically addresses this question by testing a form of early goldarty therapy in septic shock in adults in Zambia. Uh, and that will get at the issue of, are adults in Zambia like children in the FEAST trial, or are they like adults in Detroit in the uh, Rivers trial? But I'm afraid I can't tell you the answer, but it's, it specifically gets at this issue of uh, are boluses harmful in adults, etc. Okay, Hans. Uh, Hans Kierkegaard from uh, Aarhus, uh, Denmark. Uh, uh, you actually took my question, uh, Michael, but that's okay. But I can repeat it. Uh, so uh, how much fluid do you think uh, you should give uh, up front? The 30 mils or 25 or uh, 35? <laughs> um, I was actually trying to ask that question uh, in the session I was chairing yesterday. So I actually think it's a bit silly to do a bolus per kilo because at least in adults, at least in the United States now, for example, it's very typical to have a 50 or 60 kilo woman and a 120 or 130 kilo male. So if that's the case, if you're doing 30 cc's per kilo, then you would be giving twice as much volume to a man. And I'm not actually sure that the circulating blood volume for the immediate resuscitation, that it's actually twice as large. The volume of distribution will eventually be twice as large across all of the extravascular space. But I don't think that if the woman has five liters of circulating volume, the man has 10 liters of circulating volume. Um, that there'll be some relationship, but it's not linear. Um, if that were the case, then every time you transfuse someone, you would look at their weight and say, oh, you want to bring them up by a gram? Well, this person will need two units of blood, whereas this person only needs a unit. Whereas everyone's rule of thumb is that a, a unit of blood gets you about a gram, and that's pretty true across a pretty wide range of adults. So the first thing I think is um, that the, the cc's per kilo, um, that's a bit weird. Uh, I, I think it's probably, uh, it's not to say that just giving a liter is better, but, but doing it weight-based 
for a rapid expansion of the intravascular volume seems odd because the intravascular volume, I don't think, is completely linear with weight across the, the modern range of weights that adults have. Um, and then also because you don't know what the effective volume of distribution is in septic shock because of all the vasoplegia and so forth. So, so I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Practically speaking, we ended up just defaulting to a leader. Um, no one has a good solution. Interestingly, in sepsis 3, um, I'm talking about that this afternoon, that was an interesting journey with all the other sepsis mafia. When they were trying to define septic shock, there was the question of, well, it's fluid unresponsive shock. And everyone said, well, how much fluid? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the more people we had in the room, the more estimates we had of the right amount of fluid. And so the final decision, which I'm not sure it's right, was to not have fluid necessary for defining septic shock. Uh, they ended up walking away from it because they couldn't choose a number. That's a terribly disappointing answer. I give a leader. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.